Welcome to a very special edition of On the Tape. Um, I am joined today by my good friend and landlord, Stuart Saab. He is the <laughs> co-founder and CEO of Current. Many of our listeners know uh, Stuart very well. He's been a great contributor over the last year to us. He's been partaking in some conversations with Danny Moses, Guy Adami, and myself on the macro. We've also talked a whole heck of a lot about consumer trends that you guys are seeing um, through your network and, and the uh, products that you're building. And you were last on Fast Money, I think it was on Monday night with, with right. Guy and myself. That was amazing. So we're going to talk a bit more about that. But Joe Marchese, build partner and co-founder um, at Human Ventures. Now, obviously, our listeners also know Joe. And I know the mm. two of you. I know Stuart because of Joe. I think mm. he was the last person I met before COVID. I think it was the first yeah. week of March right. 2020. Yeah, yeah, we correlation did. without causation. Yeah. Yeah, I know. So you know, we all have pizza. Today. I was yeah. coughing. You yeah, were yeah, coughing, yeah, yeah. and then uh, Bar Pasquale closed for That's three it. years. Um, sorry, Ryan. Sorry, Ryan. Yeah. Um, but Joe, welcome. You called this pod. Now, just really quickly, a little housekeeping. Um, we're calling this Friends of the Pod. This is a special drop uh, yeah. on Thursday. Um, and Guy Adami and I sit down with a very good friend of ours, Karen Feinerman. She is our co-panelist on mm -hmm. CNBC's Fast Money, and a very dear friend of ours. And she just launched a new pod how she does it. We're going to talk all mm. about that. So check that out in your favorite podcast store, people. All right, Joe, I'm handing over the reins to you, buddy. What, what's, you called this pod. I, I don't know that I called it. I think Stuart and I were just on the phone, and we realized we'd both been in here multiple times. We'd never been in here together. Yes. So yeah. we wanted to prove that, like, Batman and Bruce Wayne were not the same person. <laughs> yeah. so, oh, really? Okay. Well, the okay. Spider-Man meme. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, that's yeah. right. Okay, yeah. all right, gents, let, let, let's do this thing. We're, we're kind of like the midpoint of uh, August here. So the summer's almost over. I mean, I feel like it was like a pretty active summer here in New York City. We want to talk a little bit about that. You and I have yeah. talked on the fintech front. It seems like that diaspora from Silicon Valley that we heard so much about in 2020 yeah. into 2021, whether it was you know crypto related or fintech related or whatever, it seems like New York City has clearly been a beneficiary. Joe, you and Heather have basically you made your bones here in yeah. New York. You built human. Um, not, you know, I mean, listen, you, you are, this is your backyard. It's your front yeah. yard. It's your side yard. It's everything here. It's your yeah. penthouse. Yeah. Um, also, so here, talk to us a little bit. About, let's talk about New York City because, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. Stu, you Absolutely. also built a fine firm here. I'm mm -hmm. in your headquarters here. There are hundreds of people uh, in and out of this office every day, and it feels like a very vibrant place yeah. to be. Yeah, look, when we founded Human Ventures, Heather and I, it's almost eight years ago now. New York City mm -hmm. was one of the best places in the world to start a company, but it was one of the hardest places to start a tech company. There's no center of tech like what, what San Francisco had, but it was the center of finance and media and fashion. And so it kind of feels like we don't said back then, and everyone talks about it now, uh, that all of those companies are becoming tech enabled. Mm -hmm. Like all of those companies, like tech is an, an industry, it's pervasive in every other industry. And it kind of feels like we, everything's come to a head and why New York City is booming in the early stage right now is because there's this mixture of talent that have come out of the bigger platform firms. There's There's been a focus on new innovation and new platforms. And so, I don't know, I've never felt better about building in New York right now and meeting new founders and seeing the businesses they're building. I would say one of the craziest things is that the innovation right now is that they want to make a product for a certain price and then sell it for more than that price. Crazy so idea. It's, it's a wild <laughs> concept, but I mean, the number of revenue generating companies we're seeing come in saying, okay, here's, here's the business that I'm build building and what I'm selling it for. I mean, I'd be interested in what you're seeing. Yeah, I think um, I'm, I'm always bullish New York in, in some way. I, of course, it goes through its cycles. Um, I'm part of that Tech NYC board as well here. Um, so you get to meet Eric Adams, the mayor, uh, on and off. And I think he's been instrumental. I think he's pretty good. I think he's been really good for, for the tech scene uh, of New York. Um, I think he's very cognizant from a political standpoint about the downfall and the death spiral of San Fran and, and trying to avoid some of those pitfalls, which are largely political uh, and legal in nature. And so I think having people in the helm or at the top of New York understand that and, yeah. and trying to avoid some of those pitfalls is like job one. And then job two, it's people like you, Joe, you know, putting roots down, trying to create centers of excellence, trying to create that like that, that nebulous, that 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 neuron path where people can just get shit done. I'm allowed to swear on here, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, your, yeah. it's your house. Yeah, yeah there we yeah. go. Yeah. I mean, your your yeah. rules, bro. And I mean, you need that escalator, right? So you need that escalator from seed, pre-seed, all the way through, and you just need like lots of people, lots of talent to come to this place. But Joe, talk to me um, a little bit about what you're seeing because you have this exposure to the advertising space, and it's kind of kind of. I yeah. think these kind of go hand in 
hand um, a little bit here because some of the results that we said, I'm going put my fast money hat on um, a little right. bit that we saw by some of these big platform companies that are uh, advertising enabled. What are they telling you about the economy? And then I want to talk to yeah. a little bit about the consumer and some of the things that you had to say, because I, I do think that, you know, um, while inflation has come down dramatically from that 9.1 mm -hmm. print in June of 2022 to the CPI mm -hmm. print of just 3.1 or something like that, there are parts of the economy that remain very soft. And then yeah. there are some that, like wages that <laughs> remain very sticky. And they're telling us different things about yeah. the economy right now. Yeah, it's, uh, advertising, and we could take this in, in so many different directions, advertising as a, a leading indicator of the economy, because if you want to know how a company thinks its consumer, it, what one, how they're going to buy in the next quarter, look at what their ad budgets are. But more importantly, if you want to know what they think their consumer is going to value, look at what the ad creative is. So mm -hmm. if the ad creative is, this is the best car on the market, it's the highest in safety, amazing performance, then they think consumers aren't going to be price sensitive. If their ad creative is, we'll, we'll give you low financing, um, low, low prices, mm -hmm. steep cuts, then they think the consumer is going to be price conscious, right? Mm -hmm. And so they, they're, they're trying to gauge consumer confidence before the consumer confidence index even comes out mm -hmm. like next quarter. Then if you want to look at how much money they're spending, so they have a lot of cash on the books. Like the best companies or the biggest companies in the world have a ton of cash and they can only do a couple of things, R&D, M&A. We know M&A is a bit frozen right now, or they can acquire new customers and build their brand and that's advertising. But I think the one thing that's, that's warping the entire industry right now is I've had people go out and talk about CMO jobs at large companies and they really are just performance marketing roles, mm -hmm. right? What we would call lower funnel, not upper funnel brand building. Mm -hmm. And I, I've talked about this ad nauseum, but the idea that LVMH and Bernard Arnault mm -hmm. and then Jeff Bezos and, and Amazon are like these two growing behemoths, like large brands with high margin and then platforms that eat the margin of any brand that relies upon them over time uh, is, is, is counterintuitive to the fact that most brands are shifting more and more of their spend down to the performance marketing funnel. Mm -hmm. So it's getting harder to understand like how that's going to be affected in the macro economy. You know, so, you know what's so funny? So, mm -hmm. so Joe's the guy, if you're watching us on YouTube right here, you see he's all rock and roll and everything like that. <laughs> he's the guy on the board that they bring in, you know, like we've seen it in all the shows like okay. Silicon Valley or something like that. You're not the suit, you know what I mean? But you sound like a suit sometimes a little bit. Were you a <laughs> he's suit? Like, he's your... like house, <laughs> yeah. you know, when the, the crazy doctor that wow. fixes stuff. Yeah, That's, that's a good pull. Yeah. That's some I old like tool that. stuff. I I think diagnostics. Yeah, they are. Diagnostics. Diagnostics. But, but so, Stu, so based on what he's saying about like, like how some of these big brands or some of these platforms are thinking about advertising, what that means about consumer confidence, you know, last, you guys recently launched this build product, a credit product. And I think it's really interesting because when you talk about who you guys serve, the, the average American, I think yeah. it's somewhere uh, income, a household income somewhere between, let's call it 50 and 75K. Is that That's correct right. or yeah. so? And so, you know, credit has obviously been um, a very important part, um, you know, of that kind of, I, I guess, the the finances of that sort of household. How have you guys thought about this as far as the consumer? Because we knew their balance sheets were in good shape. We know that wages have been going up, but the cost of these other things, education, healthcare, housing, they remain very sticky and, and high. So I'm just curious, like, yeah. how are you guys thinking about this? Talk to us about like the timing of the launch and kind of what you're seeing from some of the data that you guys have at hand right now. Yeah. I think um, what Joe just mentioned about consumer confidence and the and the index. I think that's all. It's all playing into what we're seeing as well. Um, the everyday American, fifty yeah. to seventy five k, um, is still spending on staples. Um, they're reducing discretionary, but they've been doing that for for some time now, um, and they're getting less for their money. And so what you're seeing is retail sales come off. We're seeing nominal things go up. That's what's really confusing for, for many market participants because some numbers look really good and some numbers look bad. So you're seeing earnings beat, but you're seeing revenue down, right? So things like that. And I think that dynamic is going to continue to play out. And so people are, um, they still need to eat and, and live and get their gas. And we're seeing some forward-looking indicators. I would say, even though you mentioned inflation coming off just recently on a year-on-year -year or quarter-on-quarter quarter quarter basis, it's, it's a nominal thing, right? So it's gone up a lot. And it, prices are stabilized high, but they're just not accelerating higher. Right. And of course, now we're in this low point. And now when you look at forward-looking indicators like gasoline and energy in Europe and things like this, you're start, I'm starting to get like a little a little worried that maybe uh, inflation may reaccelerate from this point because you mentioned things like shelter and income wages, mm -hmm. which are a part of the core inflation. They have remained really, really sticky, and they're they are. Um, they're sort of like stuck in this sort of uh, short supply uh, thing that we've just mentioned. Yeah, and, and I, you know, 
what we've seen, I've seen a lot anecdotally in areas we really want to invest in, experiential, mm -hmm. like travel, hospitality, right? The hospitality can't get enough workers. That, that's a place mm -hmm. where you're still seeing wages yeah. go up. Um, it's a huge driver of the U.S. economy, a huge employer. Um, it's something that people spend their money on. It's perfectly finite. We know there's only so many tables at a restaurant. There's only so many rooms in a hotel room, seats on an airplane, whereas digital has infinite. And, I, and I'm interested, actually, especially when mm -hmm. you look at your consumers, because the phenomenon or trend that has become like a Xi'an, like shopping for disposable items. So you can get more stuff at a cheaper price. Yeah. And it almost makes it look like the, like yeah. the cost the roll of, down. Right. The roll down. People are going to Walmart. Yeah. Um, well, more, more higher income uh, people are going to Walmart. Everyone's going down the tree a little bit now. Right. Dollar General. Or, or well, Dollar you saw, tree you saw what Dollar General said last quarter. And it's yeah. really, it's one of those things that right after you got off the set last night, yeah. um, when Melissa mentioned this, that Dollar General said, okay, so the trade down from Dollar General, and they said this, I think, on their call okay. yeah. was to food banks. Yeah, right. To yeah, food for banks. Yeah, and and right. so it's it's just crazy, yeah. you know, like, and yeah. we spent some time on the pod over the last few years talking about income inequality and, and, yeah. and, 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 and you know, how these situations when the Fed does what they do with yeah. monetary policy and they flood the zone, it really right. benefits corporations and the wealthy and that sort of thing. But it yeah, just sure. kind of widens the gap and it's a really sort of frightening thing. And I think that's yeah. probably some stuff that you're probably seeing on the edges. So when you yeah. talk about trade downs, I think it's really important that this is like a multi quarter thing. And so I want to hit on one thing here. So you you have some very smart folks on your board um, that you speak to. You are on a bunch of boards. You talk to a lot of companies that you're investing in and advising in or something. You know, this whole idea and, and that the Federal Reserve and the powers that be could basically flood the zone to a point where we've just, and Guy uses this term all the time, alchemy out recessions, mm -hmm. the normal course of business cycles. Is that starting to make some folks kind of nervous? And, and especially when you think about the pace in which interest rates have gone up, the way liquidity is coming out of the system, and the unnaturalness of the last four years, a, a thing that like many of us, we've never seen in our careers. So, Drew, I'm just curious, is like, like this recession was, um, you know, something that everybody could agree on when the S&P 500 was 3,600 yeah, in, yeah. uh, in October, and now that we're at 4,600, we are in a no landing scenario. That's why I wanted to kind of start with advertising and the consumer and get to where yeah. like the view from the board is a little bit. Yeah, I think um, from, you specifically asked about my board. I think they are hesitant with their portfolio companies. Mm -hmm. I think they are erring on the side of caution mm -hmm. um, for, for all private companies. And I don't think that has changed. I think mm -hmm. privates tend to move slower than publics mm -hmm. for all the obvious mm -hmm. reasons, right? Your marked markets are like infrequent. Um, we're, not, we're not reporting to the public market mm -hmm. on a quarterly basis, and so you're not getting those analyst calls and all that other stuff. So I think, I think for privates, it, it remains somewhat of a cautious space, especially at the, um, at the growth stage. Um, I, this idea, I, you know, I'll put my trading hat on for, for, to answer your question, mm -hmm. which is the market's too bearish for where we are trading. Like if it can't go down, it's going to go up. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like it's dumb you, you mean the sentiment among the sentiment. Like the, the sentiment's class. too bearish for yeah. where the price is. And this is the thing about nominal versus, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, uh, actual. So, like, inflation, we've inflated a lot of stuff. We've printed a lot of money. I think we've probably got more pain to the top side only on a sort of like flush out position kind of situation. Mm -hmm. And then I think real economy stuff hits Q4, Q1 next year. I, I think. You know, so if I, if I look at it from a macro perspective, I mm -hmm. think, think a lot about this, about, you know, all of the money that was injected into the system, right? And then like, if you think about it, you know, from, I, I don't have your guys' expertise on the trading, but I think we all know it's kind of like in, in casinos, the house wins mm -hmm. uh, eventually, <laughs> right? Because it's, it's taking a vig on everything or it's, it's, it's taking a rake on, on every hand or it has, it has just a couple points in its favor. Well, all that money flooded the zone and the, the people who are the market makers, like the money accumulated to them at some point. At some point, the retail investors, whether it was, like through the crypto world or mm -hmm. meme stock investing or or just yeah. going out and buying things like, like with it and then the, that money just began to pull back to the top, which, as you just said, that the gap widened. And then the money at the top needs to find a place to invest in. And mm -hmm. there aren't many asset classes to go invest in. Hence, why you see these blue chip like uh, yeah. stocks going like through mm -hmm. the through the roof without any regard for multiple. So then the question is, how do you invest in private markets at that? Like, what's your what's your time horizon mm -hmm. for return? I mean, we think about it, and at an early stage, where we say this will be our our best class, our best vintage, because. Um, you know, eight to 10 years from now, like what will you have invested in won't have any legacy, um, any legacy uh, capital structures. But I think 
the part that I still don't know, and I, I wrote something about this, which is, so I do believe AI will provide efficiencies to work, but you had said it earlier, revenue is down, but EBITDA is up in these places. That, that mm -hmm. sounds like an efficiency play. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's right. That sounds like a continued concentration of wealth. So like, how are we going to get things that aren't captured in GDP and kind of reward those? Uh, so, you know, elder care, like, um, a child care, volunteerism, you know, we'll talk later about Team Rubicon. Yeah. Like, is that government's role? And so, I know we, we look at that and say, I, I don't see how we buck this trend. Like technology has made it so that even on a lower income, people are living better mm -hmm. than they had been for a very long time. And that's kind of mm -hmm. stemmed the tide of that gap widening. But have we hit kind of the logical end of that? I think, listen, you know, before we were in this AI craze um, pre-pandemic, I mean, the, the whole, you know, we were talking about universal basic income because the automation, we weren't really talking about AI at the time. We were talking about automation. We we're talking about robots, right? And we know that obviously those things are tied, but they were yeah. going to take all the jobs, right? And so how are we going to keep people busy, right? right? Like, so um, I, I just think it's interesting that how quickly that narrative um, has shifted a little bit. Um, you know, mm -hmm. Joe, you've talked a little bit about, you know, kind of digital transformation among different sectors. You started out by saying you built the um, first, um, you know, uh, I guess, tech-enabled tequila company. So talk, <laughs> so talk, so talk, so talk a little bit about how New York has Robots become, getting drunk. Yeah, become, the, become the center yeah, of tech-enabled tequila. This would be Como's tequila. I think our funny. listeners are very familiar with it. Um, I, I, it is 10 a.m. when we're recording here, or otherwise <laughs> we might have had I filled um, my filled a, my essential a, a, a comos a little bit. Um, but what's oh. what's going on? What's going on with CK? Uh, no, no, no. So first of all, I did not build oh. uh, 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 or create or mix. I uh, I would not eat or drink anything I make. I live on uh, Uber Eats and Postmates and <laughs> caviar. So uh, I've seen uh, yeah, our, our, uh, Christy and I do not use do not use our kitchen. Um, but I did uh, you know as is as is the remit of human ventures back back the best builders in the world. Here's one 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 to my yeah. left and yeah. then one who's not in the room, Richard. Beck. Um, Master Sommelier, just an absolute legend in the hospitality industry. We shook hands seven years ago, and I, you know, said, "Just yeah. make, just make, just make luxury tequila, like make modern luxury." And we had no idea. Now, you know, he, fast forward, he's built the fastest, and we've done it together, and in many ways, uh, the fastest growing ultra luxury tequila in the world. It's an amazing product. I think Stu and I can attest to it. <laughs> well, I, the rumor is Joe is creating uh, another alcohol brand because I don't like tequila that much. That was the rumor. <laughs> oh, yep. really? He was sick of me turning it down because I'm no. not a tequila drinker. I'm like, uh, but anyway, I'm looking forward to it. This, 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 is, this, is <laughs> this is the tequila for non-tequila drinkers. I, I'm, right? I'm going to yeah. tell you this. I, yeah. I literally swore off because like like many of us in our like like late teens, early 20s, <laughs> that was had a lot of Cuervo. And, yeah. and we're like, I'm done. I, right. The smell of it yeah. made me no. ill. That's it. This is like, to me, like a fine scotch. I mean, yeah. I really do. And I just, I all literally right. drink it I on a big rock. Yeah, and I think right. you've seen me do like a thousand of them. All right, before, <laughs> before we get out of here, and, yeah. and again, I, I think we wanted to bring this group together because we all pod, we all talk individually off a mic uh, quite frequently, but we wanted to touch base um, a little bit and hopefully we'll do it for a longer period of time. But really quickly, and this is something that, you know, uh, you know, oftentimes a guy and myself, we say this, uh, we're, uh, we're on CNBC set and there's like horrible news outside of the financial markets going on here. Mm -hmm. And sometimes like when we don't even address it, you feel like like you were just like a horrible person, but what's gone on in Hawaii, specifically obviously in Maui, is devastating. And Joe, talk to me a little bit. You're on the board of Team Rubicon. Jake Wood was the founder of that organization. Jake's yep. been on the pods before. You also co-founded with him Groundswell a little bit. So I want yep. you to kind of thread the needle, um, talk sure. a little bit about what Team Rubicon is doing in response to the disaster in Maui. Yep. And we're going to talk about how we and friends of the pod can support um, this disaster relief through yep. Team Rubicon and through Groundswell. Yeah, so, so Team Rubicon is is an amazing organization that retrains veterans for, and uh, it's a veteran-led organization that retrains mostly veterans, but also civilian partners for disaster relief. Mm -hmm. So then they go into areas where they can't, they're, they're doing work in Ukraine right now. They, they do work after hurricanes, they do work after flooding, tornadoes. Um, right now they're sending specialized, specially trained um, team members from Team Rubicon to Maui to help with the recovery efforts, the basically um, the mucking, rebuilding uh, of the area. And they'll be there for the long haul. So like, you know, these disasters happen and really they're rebuilding for six months, but two months from now, people won't be talking about the disasters mm -hmm. and Team Rubicon will mm -hmm. still be on the ground there. Um, so Jake, who had founded Team Rubicon, saw that corporate philanthropy was wildly inefficient. And so he began, he came to me and we said he wanted to start Groundswell, which was going to turn corporate philanthropy into an employee benefit. So everyone can have a DAF in their pocket. Every, people who listen to this pod probably know what a donor advised fund is, but not everybody else does. And so uh, through Groundswell, he wanted to make giving as easy as using a Venmo account. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's what Groundswell is. So he's at Groundswell now. So uh, I think we talked a little bit before, but um, for anyone who wants to donate to TR uh, using the Groundswell app, I will then 
2x match. I'll match both to the TR for Maui Relief, mm -hmm. and I'll match to the charity of their choice. We'll you, set this up on the pod app. You're the man. We're going to put all of that in the show notes. Guy and I are going to put in $5,000 towards that effort. So any of our same. listeners <laughs> who um, really appreciate um, you know, the work that, that Jake has done from the get-go, you've been mm -hmm. on the board for a long time yep. and at, at Team Rumikon and what he's doing at Groundswell, making it easy to kind of keep track of all those kind of philanthropic efforts. And this is an important one. So we'll put all of that information, how to contribute um, to that. So thank you, Joe. Thank mm -hmm. you, Jake. Hey, Stu. Hi. Thanks for having me, man. Um, no, thank oh, you. thank you as for ever. being here. I feel like we've had a lot of each other, but you'll get Stu <laughs> Maybe too much, uh, is that back. No, 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 no. You'll get <laughs> Stu else. back with, with Danny Guy and myself. Hopefully Great. in the next few weeks, we'll talk markets. We'll talk about the consumer. And Joe, um, you always have a seat in front of this mic, so we really right. appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks guys, for, for having being me. here. I appreciate it. Stick around for my conversation with Guy Adami and Karen Feinerman when we come back from this break. And we are back with a special edition of the On The Tape podcast. We're calling this Friends of the Pod. So let me set it up. You heard the laughter, but I don't want to give it away too early. Just you know, this is also on video. Oh, so they see it all. Yeah, right. yeah. So, so there's a, there's so no big see. reveal. Maybe so on the no audio for portion, there's well, a big the, reveal. Well, the audio people have to wait. And they read the show notes. No, nobody reads the show notes. Her name's going to be in the In title. early 2007. Yeah. There was, there was this Trader Monthly magazine. It was like sort of porn for traders. Ugh. I'm telling you, Eric Bowling was on the cover. A bunch of people are on hot. the cover. That sounds hot. And then one of the issues comes out, and this stunning young lady is on the cover. It was Karen Feinerman. Yeah. And I think Mary Duffy must have seen that. And before you know it, Karen was appearing on CNBC's Fast Money. Fast forward to today, August of 2023, and I can say this. I don't know if Karen feels the same way. <laughs> I love Karen Feinerman. She is a dear friend. And Fast Money, obviously, we took a turn for the better back in January, February of 2007. So I am thrilled that you're joining us here. I am thrilled to be here. True. I love you guys. I mean, I I, I have to just make one little She change. said, I love you guys, I except Dan. I wasn't on the cover. Oh. No, I, I thought you were on the uh, cover. Renee Haggard, who is a great uh, commodities trader, was from Cargill. I could have um, sworn. Well, you, well, anyway, you had a huge picture. I did. I did. I, was, I guess it was, the. And I mean, as it turns out, sort of like the centerfold of Trader yeah. Monthly magazine. <laughs> But I digress. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I would say, obviously, look, Fast Money was what it was all through 06. You came in immediately. The IQ of yeah. that show went up, <laughs> despite the fact that Jeff Mackey's IQ is probably yes. 170 something. Yes. And that we was clicked right away. Just of that course first, we did. That first uh, test or but whatever But think was. about how difficult that must have been, because you're coming into uncharted territory with a bunch of big dudes, you know, and... It's you have to maintain your femininity. Obviously, your intelligence speaks for itself. That's not an easy seat to to sort of slot yourself into. How was that for you? Well, it's not an easy seat, except that being on Wall Street at that mm -hmm. time was kind of like that. And going just back to my childhood, I always wanted to be on the boys' teams. I always wanted, you know, that seemed like more fun to me. And so I'm just comfortable in that. So I, I like the challenge. Well, she was, Karen was the perfect person to come in at the perfect time for our show. And obviously then Dan came in a couple of years later and here we are today, the three of us sitting around podcasting. <laughs> we didn't even know I what a podcast was. No was. <laughs> Actually, podcasts did exist back then. But well, okay, fine. Let's, let's yeah. talk about this for a second because Guy just said this. And I remember looking up at the screens at, at five o'clock at Fast Money back in the day. And I was not, you know, I, I was, I, I think I first went on uh, CNBC in 2009 on Options Action. And I'd look up there and I literally would see four six foot two, 220 pound guys as the panelists and a similar looking guy as the host. And I, it, you know, I, that, that was what I looked at every yeah. And then all of a sudden, there was a Pain woman who show, you yeah. showed up. It, it, and you paved the way for Mel. Who, who, when did she start hosting? In 2009 March or something two, like that? March of 2009, I believe. But okay. I might be the, off. The show it, had so. a locker room feel to it. By design, yeah. actually. Mm -hmm. And then I think, I mean, you know, Susan Krakauer, who is so talented... Um, that was it. That was, she wanted to be like, okay, they've just come off the right. field, yeah. and now's the post game wrap up. How is how has so, your um, TV persona changed since that? Like, like, let's say once you got it under your belt, right? It probably took like twenty five episodes or something like that. Does it make sense to get comfortable least, with the whole me, thing? I don't know. I was really at the beginning. I, you seemed to really. Dan, come in very easily, and you were born doing this. You probably came <laughs> out of the womb. Out of the womb. 
Uh, thanks, Mom. Our next guest is... <laughs> so, you know, it's easy for you guys, but I was always worried about what was I going to say. So worried about the content. And when you write down everything you're going to say, you're never going to get to it. It's never going to flow that way so that you feel like you can say what you wanted to say. So that was a big change. And all right, throw that out the window. Just think about a few points you want to make and sort of see where it goes. And um, I mean, you guys were always very generous from the beginning and, you know, kind of let the new kid. Is, is it funny, is though, it? like you think about it over the years is like I, I think that like we all have this kind of casualness to us about it. And I think we've obviously done a really good job on the program and kind of bringing some, um, you know, like, uh, you know, some personality into this stuff. But we all take this stuff really seriously. And it's kind of funny because every once in a while we get a little heated with each yes. other. You and I haven't gotten heated in a while. You and I used to get heated like little little hopped up. I think yeah. we did it last month a little bit. And the We're, thing that I, I think is so funny, Karen, and you seem to be like you don't get heated like 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 but like people always say when it comes to investing or trading like you got to take the motion out of it and you know i've been doing this for you know since 1997 i've always been very emotional about it so i'm just curious like how do you think about that because you do have a very even keel to you but you must get worked up sometimes like yeah. you've come on and you've had a stock down you know 15, 20 percent or something like something or you've more, owned for a while. A yeah. And and mm -hmm. I might not even know that's the case. You know what I mean? Now uh -huh. I would be like, you know, like popping off the walls or something like that. Yeah, I do. I feel like the emotions just head you in the wrong direction mm -hmm. when you're in the market, right? And and it feels like, you know, when things are going up, you want to own them all. And when they're going down, you don't want to own anything. And I, that's not for me. It's just um I I really hate feeling stupid. Mm -hmm. And the market gives you that often step in my shoes <laughs> i mean that's a nightly occurrence and and it's difficult the, i admire you for a myriad of reasons and i mean that sincerely and one of the reasons is our show is difficult for you i think at times because we you know unless you feel extraordinarily strong about something i think it's hard for you and i admire that because you know we wax poetic about a lot of things almost on a nightly basis. How difficult is that for you? You know, having to talk about things that you might not feel as strongly about as uh -huh. you do in your daytime seat. Right. That's a good question because I, I find it hard. You know, I always say if I come up with 10 great ideas a, a year. year, that's fantastic. Yeah. And if I'm on the show, you know, you at least to find out you got to come up with one mm -hmm. every day. And that's hard because... I do. I think we all take that responsibility seriously about you say things and people hear it and they feel like, oh, OK, well, that's sort of the good housekeeping seal. I can buy that stock or I should sell that stock. And then, you know, you hear it on Twitter. I hate I hate the haters. <laughs> I, I really try not to respond. You guys do. Well, Dan, you're like, screw it. I'm not I'm, not, I'm just not dealing with you. But yeah. you do a very good job of sort of uh, you I know, try to be yes. surgical in my approach to the haters. You know, I'm, yes. I'm like sort of a counterpuncher yeah. for the Listen, haters. Listen, I, I got to tell you guys, you, you, we talked about it on the show back in early April. You know, I was kicked off Twitter in April 1st, and I literally have probably spent a combined three hours on Twitter since then. And I will mm -hmm. tell you, it is like, un, it's been an unliberating for me. <laughs> it really has yeah. been in a lot of ways. And it's not that I don't, I, I, I heard from a lot of haters. You also hear from a lot of people who really appreciate what yes. we do um, and how we do it. But I think, you know, we are all parents we have kids who are all you know like late teens or early 20s now and we've seen what what has happened to these kids which is very different than the way we were brought up you know the fact is it's like we had to be present in the here and now and now we've watched our kids grow up over the last 10 years and their their lives and their emotions have been dictated by some anonymous could be troll or somebody that they don't that thinks it has their best interest that they know in their lives and stuff like that. And I think a little bit about the responsibility that we feel that we have with our viewer or our listener here and everything like that. And I got to tell you, you, we, we, I, I think all of us, you guys are tweeting. I, I, I hear it. I don't see us talking about tweets anymore and this mm -hmm. and that or whatever. Think about CNBC. Every hour on the hour, they were putting up tweets from the former president. They were putting tweets of the responses of this. They were putting tweets of a scene. It's kind of going away. And I think it's a really liberating thing. Now, all that said, going back to transparency and accountability and why we take this so seriously, Karen, like there was a world you were never tweeting nearly as much as us. You were kind of really good at it when you did drop in. Um, <laughs> 
um, that sort of thing. So how do you think about the relationship with the viewer? Now you have listeners and you have listeners of your own. And this is what we found over the last few years doing this podcast. This is a very intimate relationship. Someone went and sought your podcast out right. and we hope and we're going to talk about it a great deal, okay, how she does it, okay, so you can find it in your favorite podcast store, people, and please go subscribe to it. I've been listening to it, and it's been amazing, but this is something that people are going out to do. They found you, they're subscribing, and then they're in, you're, you're in their ear when they're walking their dog, they're going to work, they're on the treadmill, that sort of thing. So talk to us about that responsibility, because you're going to find your relationship with your your viewer, your listener, it's, it's really going to change from what you experienced over the last five years or so. Uh -huh. I th that's a, a great way to think about it versus the Twitter sphere, yeah. where every, or yeah. X sphere, whatever it is now, where everyone is just kind of floating around. I think that that listener is far more likely to like you to going into it, right? They wouldn't be looking yeah. for you guys if they didn't, weren't interested in what you had to say. So that's nice. You feel like, all right, I have a welcoming audience. But it really is, it's fun for me, and I know you guys find, find it very fun, is to meet these women, some of whom I know already, some I don't, and really hear their stories. And everybody has a story, right? And everybody has a a setback, a failure, a path that they didn't expect, something. And I feel like I love learning from that. If I can learn from somebody else's mistakes, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Next best, learn from your own, not as good. And then not <laughs> learning from your own, which I've also done that a few times, is not good. But I just, I'm fascinated by their stories. I'm fascinated by, you don't know what else is going on in their life beside their career, maybe. And... Um, I don't know just how they do it, how they manage, how they pick up from, you know, Julie Wainwright we did right. and how she picks up from, you know, being told she'll never get hired again, mm -hmm. things like that. Or Melissa Lee, who, you know, well, you guys know her story well, but, you know, of how she, her, her parents, her father said, if you don't go to business school, you're making the biggest mistake mm -hmm. of your life. Turned out all right for Melissa Lee as she... So That's what cute. was the genesis? This is probably something you've thought about for years going in. Yeah. Obviously, this medium didn't exist to be able to do it. So maybe you thought potentially you wrote a book, best-selling mm -hmm. book. Maybe this could have been another book. But instead, podcasting comes along. The light bulb goes off and say, I have an opportunity to sort of do this through a different lens. Is that mm -hmm. sort of how it all came to pass? You know, I think it's, uh, I love the company of women sort of feeling comfortable in a, together. So I do this investing club with Jean Chatsky, and that sort of, it was sort of Jean's idea, and it really resonated when she said it. Uh, you know, I love that time to really get to know someone, and she thought she could help make it into, she could help introduce it to audiences, and I don't know, I find it really interesting it's sort of energizing to like oh this week i have on this person mm -hmm. you know and it's fun right i mean it's a lot of fun yeah what have you mm -hmm. learned what's been the common thread you've i want to say you've done five and if i'm wrong please correct me i think I mean, only five have been out five I've have been out ten. okay fair enough so you have 10 five are out oh, but let's talk about of the five that are out what's the common thread do you think you they don't end up where they thought they were going right. to at the beginning and something usually went wrong, not right, and then they and then they had to they had to react. Now, is that true for your path? Do you, are you where you thought when you know you're in Wharton in the 1980s? Uh -huh. Is this where you, you know, forgetting yeah. about fast money and mm -hmm. the nonsense of t is this where you thought you were going to be? Kind of, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I wanted to go to Wall Street, and I, I mean. I wanted to be a risk arbitrager when right. I was 16. I who that. the hell wants to be a risk arbitrager <laughs> Nobody. when they're 16? Ivan Boesky, maybe. Ivan what? Boesky was how I thought you pronounced his right. name because I never heard anyone say it. Can I play it. producer for a second sure. here? Yeah, Because I think the got? 11th episode should be how she does it. Oh. And I think Guy Adami wow. should interview oh. her just to end the season with a bang. Can you imagine wow. that? I don't, right. That's a thought. That's a thought. Is, is, is I don't that think Gene would be happy right. with that. But here's another question. So Guy just mentioned your book. And I remember when Feynman Rules came out. 
about. And I remember reading it. I remember my kids were kind of young and I want to actually pick it back up and I want them to think about it. And so when I think about this, our, our fine pod, uh, podcasting partner, Danny Moses, okay, he has been such an interesting um, addition to what we do because we are like the ephemeral guys. We are the fast money guys, uh-huh. right? Like hot takes, markets, this and that. trying to be very thoughtful. When we first met Danny, he literally, he takes it, he's got a different way of being a, a pundit because he doesn't do it every day like we do. He really wants to educate people. He wants to go into the weeds on some of these things. And he, you and I got, have learned a mm-hmm. lot from Danny over the last few years, talking with him once or twice a week on a mic. What is it about what you do that you really do? Like this whole series, how she does it, is really about education for all intents and purposes. There's no common theme, and I've listened to a bunch of them so far. It's really telling personal stories, interjecting a little bit of your own experience, how you know those sorts of folks, and then going back to the book. It's, it's about education. So talk to me about that. Did you ever, like, did you think of yourself as an educator at some point here? No, I didn't. That The book sort of came around. I don't know how it came about, actually. But I did at the time feel like I have something to say. Mm-hmm. And if I had to put it into one sentence, it was how women get in their own way and how they can help get out of their own way. And some of that is learning from men. It's interesting. So, so, okay, so let's mm -hmm. talk about that for a second, because obviously my wife works and I've said this to her. I believe this. I think women sometimes pose the greatest obstacles for other women in their industries that they're in. As much as you would think they'd be championing one another, sometimes it's women that can be the most difficult for other women trying to move up. Am I accurate in that, or have you not found that? I haven't really, well, it's. I think it's more women being their own, mm-hmm. uh, their own roadblock, right? It's women, so you're, an un- you're both actually unusual dads, incredibly engaged. I mean, this guy does laundry, guy, I'm pointing to. That guy, probably not. I do a little laundry. <laughs> I, do a little I do a laundry. shitload of laundry. I do my own laundry. I don't do my kids' laundry. Um, you you're know, smart. Well, yeah. well, I'm, I, I've been browbeaten to submission with that. And then, you know, <laughs> but again, well, this is now completely off the yeah, rails. Let's do it. Yeah, go. You should allow them. I, I agree. But I think they do it half-assed knowing that it's going to piss me off. And then knowing that I will then subsequently take over again. There's a genius. Yes. In, do you admire it, that genius? I, I do to a, mm-hmm. to a point. But when you do something, whether it's – and I say this, whatever you decide to do, don't do it half-assed. Do it uh-huh. the correct way. Don't fix your bed half-assed and don't do the laundry half-assed. So maybe I'm old school, but – that's something Maybe that you're learned. old school, Karen. Do you have an opinion on that? I'm ridiculously old school. You are old school, but it doesn't need to be mutually exclusive. But, but you can be right and old school. That's true. Not but, everything old school is terrible. I, I agree with it's that. It's funny because yeah. we're thinking about this through the lens of women here. And, and we just talked about being parents and engaged. And, and, and again, we've all known each other for a long time now. And we've seen our kids grow up and you guys longer than, than me. You have two sets of twins, okay? Like yeah. two just got out of college a couple of years ago. Two are getting out of college and... and, and in around the next yep. year or so. And you've been amazingly engaged. You've had this amazing career. Your husband has an amazing business, an amazing career. How have you guys kept it all together? Because it's not that common that you can have two very successful parents and then bring up four kids. And let me tell you something. I am one of two sets of I twins, know, that's as crazy you know. Too, yeah. And it is, uh, you, you want to put any household together, that's about as weird as it gets <laughs> right there. And you've kept it all together brilliantly. A ton of help is yeah. really, I mean, there's no way. Here's the, I mean, Lawrence is incredibly involved, incredibly organized, you know, has the packing trip list. If it's ski trip, you then, you know, that's a different list. And you put in how many days and it comes out how many sweaters you need and how many, what each kid needs. That's where William gets it. Yeah. I, you William, know, there are a lot of similarities. Listen, yeah. obviously, there are a lot of similar. I would say William and your husband are the most similar, <laughs> looking from 30,000 feet. And I yeah. think that's accurate. I think you and Kate, there's some similarities there as well. I yeah. mean, you know, and then obviously yeah. Lucy and Jack as well. But those, that's sort of the, that's the dots that I would connect. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I love that you know that. Well, yeah. you pay attention. It's the cheapest <laughs> but, thing yeah, you, you can do. But it's a lot did, of help, though. I always to... say just one thing yeah. for any woman who's trying to balance it all, give up everything 
and get more help. Give up clothing, yeah. food, housing, get more help. That's where I was going. <laughs> like, what, what kind of um, compromises did you have to make professionally, though? Like, like did you at any uh, step of the way? And, yes. and how do you, aside from that great piece of, uh, of um, you know, a guidance there, like, what, what, how would you advise people? And is the changing, like, the way people work, is that going to benefit women as they try to break into fields where it are, they are male-dominated? Uh, I think it can help or hurt. I think there's a little more flexibility, but I think the, to me, the boundary between work and home is so important. And if you have to keep crossing that, mm -hmm. that's going to be really hard, particularly on the women, mm -hmm. right? If they can, leave, you know, your kids really resent you if they know you're home and you're not paying attention. But if you leave and they go, you go to the office, they know that. They know that they have no expectation of seeing you. It's interesting. So, so if you're home, you should be home and you think, should be yes, present. No, that's, right. that's fair. And I think that's great advice. If you're going to be present, be friggin' present. Don't right. pretend that you know, you're home, but you're working in your office that's, because that's actually worse. Exactly. It's the worst of everything. Each side, the work and the home, think you're not engaged. You're just focused on the other one. So you might as well And go. you think you're doing the right thing for right. both, and it winds up you're doing the wrong thing. I'm so, guilty yeah. of that so, all so the time. So let's, let's hit this, because, um, Karen, you, you do a, an amazing job of, like, melding some things that you're passionate about. And one of them, on uh, many days, I think once a week for the last few weeks, mm -hmm. you've been cutting out of fast money, like, heading for the subway, heading to Brooklyn, okay? So yeah. here is a passion. It's sport, okay? But it's also a professional sort of endeavor. Talk, tell the, 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 the listener here or the viewer a little bit about, like, your interest in the WWE. WNBA and, and women's sports because you are a bit sporty yourself. I uh -huh. hear she's a heck of a uh, paddle yeah, player, yeah. Uh, uh, pickleball. tennis, no, <laughs> pickleball. pickleball. And, and and there was a little challenge here that didn't. Yeah, that didn't that's come there's extenuating circumstances. Okay. Just, just there, to be really clear, Guy Adami said in a commercial break one day, "I will beat anybody," and he said, "I've never picked up a pickleball racket before. I will beat anybody." And Karen, who was doing her work in the break for a second, looked up like, "Done. Let's You're do done. Let's do it." All right, but talk to us a little bit about your interest in sport. Obviously, you were an athlete, but yep. your involvement now in your interest in the WNBA. Uh huh. Well, interesting. You two both were athletes, and you know what a great formative experience it is from the team. There's that. There's being in good shape, getting in good shape. Um, but there's the structure, and I think you do so much better in every field, whether it's work or schoolwork or whatever it is, when you have that structure of a team and discipline, and you know that you've got to use your time wisely. I always thought I did much better in school during the mm -hmm. season than off the season. Off the season, you feel like, oh, I got all night. I could do whatever I want. And then you end up getting nothing done. But so I've always been a, a champion of women's sports. I've looked, I looked at a tennis team, and that wasn't really of interest. I looked at some WNBA teams, and I wasn't the right person to own it. And well, you the, were the right mm -hmm. person to own it. it, but it just didn't come to fruition. I mean, but you were the absolute right person to own well, it, well, but the, that's the my problem opinion. with owning it that time it was it's not what you pay for the team; it's that you are on the hook forever. Yeah. <laughs> for mm -hmm. at the time was losses as far as the eye could see. Right. So that's a different calculus. So um, the WNBA has been transformed, and Kathy Engelbert, who's the commissioner, who I think has done an extraordinary job. It's I mean we were Barclays was full and rocking two weeks ago. The last yeah. time we went right and. That so I made an investment in the WNBA, the league, to they want to transform it, they want to spend a lot more money, and the whole plan is to really increase the viewership, the popularity, all of that prior to their next big media rights. Um, and they're on the, yeah. the thing about this the conversation we had a few years ago was you'd rather be in a Westchester, um, you know, the the, the gym and what, what are they called? Yeah, Westchester County. I Westchester wouldn't. Can, no, but but, Lo Dolan would. Yeah, yeah, because at least you're filling it up. Now you're mm -hmm. filling out the Barclays. I mean, so yeah. you're mm -hmm. putting fannies in the seats, as they say. And I'll tell you, having watched a bunch of games, and I think a lot of it came on the heels of the women's tournament, which was amazing. The women's mm -hmm. college tournament really was amazing. Yeah. I mean, those teams can ball. And the women now in the league – the level of play is exponentially better today than it was even three or so years ago. And that's obviously a tribute to the players in the league. Yeah, it is. And, and I think they, they want to expand because they want to give – there's so many great college players yeah. with not enough spots to go. You know, there's not enough spots for all of them. And that's why they play in other, and to make more money. But hopefully now this, this WNBA ecosystem can have more money. Have, um, I mean, because the women make – at most, 
one tenth, mm-hmm. at very, very, very most, mm-hmm. one tenth of what a male player does. The first, you know, my daughter, uh, Kate, loves basketball. She uh, was doing a paper on it, Googled WNBA, and it said, did you mean NBA? Mm-hmm. And it was sort of a, a, you know, a nice little metaphor, like, wow, they, they've got a ways Chat to GPT-4 go. Chat GPT-4 wouldn't have done that. <laughs> I, don't, I think I, you're I, right. No, I, I don't get involved so. in these No, things. it's pretty, it, it's interesting to also watch the arc of your enthusiasm about this too, because you were looking on a micro level at a specific team, and those are a totally different set of economics, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. But now, like the way you're involved in it on a macro level, it seems like well suited for you and your positioning and that sort of thing. Um, let, let's talk about positioning. Let's talk about the markets a little bit here. Yeah, um, because, you know, it, it's funny. I, I think like the folks at CNBC and Guy, you know, 17 years in January, if we make it that if far. We if we make it. If we make it, it as Guy says January all the time. I've been saying that. <laughs> I've been saying years. if we make if we it for 17 years. <laughs> and, and you are literally one of the originals. You were literally, the, the, I'm sure you were part of the whiteboard session and, yeah. and that sort of thing as they were thinking about it. So I, I'm just curious, Guy, from your standpoint, like how is the, the how has the show changed? And, and and one of the things I think is really interesting because when I think about us, when it's like you, original, Karen, which I think is like original, Tim is right right mm-hmm. there from the beginning. I came in, I think, in 2011 um, a little bit, but we've been doing this for a long time now. We all kind of have different skill sets. Uh, and so it's not like we're all sitting there looking at the same things mm-hmm. all day long or something. How do you think th- it's changed for you? And then I'd love to hear from Karen a little bit about like, because you are an investor uh, longer term, you don't really care too much about the day to day unless there's some big fundamental thing or some big macro thing. And so I want to get into that, like what it's like to be on a show called Fast Money when you have a value bent and an investing bent. Yeah. Well, from my vantage, I never liked the name, but we weren't in charge of yeah. naming the show. I mean, obviously the show was named what it was named and we have no input. So It was named with Mad Money, I think, the Mad Money, Fast Money. It was, it was obvious. Yeah. yeah. It was some sort of amalgam, whatever it was. But I think that was a disservice in the early years. But as Mel said last night on our show, at least in the commercial break, I think people have learned that, you know, don't associate the name with, I think, the intelligence or the questions that we ask. The way the show has changed in a lot of ways, people want to come on this show now. In the early days, we would have to ask people to come on. Nowadays, I think people understand. When I say people, guests understand. It's a great form for she or he to come on and sort of get their message out, whether it's a CEO of a company, an analyst, uh, an economist, any of those things. So in that regard, I think we've evolved in a lot of ways. Obviously, I think the world has changed considerably over the last 17, 18 or so years. Politics never made its way into our show for a long time. It's changed, obviously, under the Trump administration. And I think that's probably genies out of the bottle for a while. But I think at its core, it's still a show, and I use this word, aspirational for people. Not that people want to be Guy Adami or Dan Nathan necessarily. I'm sure they want to be Karen. They'd love to be able to hang out with us. And I think that's what the show sort of lends itself to on a nightly basis. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one thing I always think is funny about or great about our show is the commercial breaks, the green room. I mean, we enjoy enjoy each each other's company. Yeah, and um, I think the show has changed a lot. Uh, Melissa, obviously, was a very mm-hmm. different vibe from Dylan, who was great and, and was very impassioned, particularly during the great financial crisis. Yeah. And then Melissa, who's got a different vibe, and she really had to make it... There her was show. nobody that was going to be Dylan again. So she made it her show, and I think she makes us all better. Um, but I think that... I, we do try to stay out of politics, with the exception of Dan. And well, I no, think that, I, but, but it's funny you no, say that. No, I think it, it's. It, it, I think you're brave to do it. No, no, actually, but but this was during 15, 16, 17, and you know one of the things that I just took issue with was, was the media in general. You know, we would literally be doing our show, and there would be an empty podium waiting for. Donald Trump, you, you know what I mean? Like, like to say something like nonsensical about the economy that was going to move something in some direction, and I just took issue with that. So he would come on, he would say something, then they come to us, and I just tell it like it is. And and to be honest with you, in hindsight, it aggravated a lot of people, and that was one of the things that made social media, I think, less fun during that period. Okay, but the truth is. 
we were right about it all. Look at what's going on here. I'm, I'm just saying, like, it was a shit show, and, and it's proved, proven to be that way, but we don't talk about politics anymore because the media, they, I, I think they kind of got burned by it. You know, you know what I mean? And they became the villains in the whole thing, and that's the thing. So I just thought, let's just be honest intellectually about all of this. And for me, yes, my politics were important about it. I think I'm on the right side of history on a lot of this sort of stuff, but at the end of the day, it's not for me to tell someone else that their views as it relates to politics are bad or wrong or that sort of thing. But I, I did, I did, I, listen, I'm so glad we are not in that place where we were during that administration because we're not talking about it anymore. But Karen, talk to us a little bit about this notion of, again, you're not there for hot takes. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. Like there can be a stock. It can be 530 and a conference call is going and a stock just turned and it's gone down 10% and this and that, whatever. And you have a level of calm, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. that I think is reassuring to a whole host of folks, you know, that sort of thing. How, how, is, it, how is it to be a value investor who takes a longer term time horizon on a show called Fast Money, where a lot of the people tuning in are waiting for that next thing to, to buy something or sell something fairly quickly. Yeah, I think was there the, you know, you feel like you're you're wearing the wrong thing to an event kind of, <laughs> yeah. right? And because um, I just, it doesn't really matter to me so much where something trades on the day. But I do, one thing that I have learned, and I still value and valuation is always first to me, is I always thought charting was kind of, you know, Mm -hmm. Not a real thing. It was it, it, it was a real thing, but I didn't think it had any value. Mm -hmm. But I actually have come around to believe that it does. Um, it's a craft. But regardless of whether it is or not, if enough people believe that charting is a thing, right. well, then it's a thing, mm -hmm. right? I don't need to, you know, if enough people think a bank is solvent, it's solvent. And if enough people think it isn't, it won't be. So that's been a big change. That's something I. Well, it's funny though. So, so, so explain for just a second when you start in the business as a risk arbiter, like you're yes. literally looking at one security versus another. Versus it, another. Was just, it was just math. It right? was like, just math and the contract. What does yes. the contract say? How yeah. likely is this deal to happen? So that's not like surprising to me. When I started in the business, my job, uh, the guy that I worked for gave me, you ready for this? A compact computer that was like four feet <laughs> like deep, you know what I mean? And had this program loaded up and I had to hook up a phone line to it and download, you know, a thousand new ticks on a thousand new charts for the movement of that day. And every night I had to look through all of them looking for five patterns, reversal patterns, breakout patterns, this and that, whatever. And every morning I had to come in with that list. So to me, I learned technicals before I knew much about fundamentals. Uh -huh. And so I've always thought of it as an important input. But I do think it's interesting, you sitting on that desk for the last 15 years or so, and think about TV is a very visual medium, right? Uh -huh. And charts work. Max Myers used right. to say that to us all the time back in the day. So it sounds like you've learned a little bit. You've put a new tool in your toolbox. Yes. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's Carter <laughs> a lot of times. But right, I, I feel like, all right, it's another thing that I didn't take into account that I probably should have. And, uh, you know, also as a value investor, this meme phenomenon, right. first, that it's persisted this long is astounding to me, despite what happened in the markets in 22. You'd think that would have shaken out uh, a lot of those investors, that's astounding to me. That's a whole other level of something that I cannot explain and don't want to get in the middle of because I don't understand it. But it's real, even though I think it's crazy. Like, I don't get how, in the end, I you know, value will out is the expression. I don't get how things mm -hmm. trade with, I don't, I, I don't know what to make of it. Go back to your podcast. So, ten women, five are out, five coming out. Yep. that's season one. There's going to be season two, two yeah. and three and four, whatever. But you can do ten thousand women. So, who's on your laundry list of people you'd love to interview? Um, Billie Jean King, mm -hmm. is which way somebody up you there. know. Uh, I, I would love to get her. Um, I everyone from Mariska Hargitay, right? Um, to um, well, I yeah. mean, I know your personal favorite. I mean, I can't believe you left her out. Jodie Foster. Jodie Foster. That is interesting. She's high on your list. Well, interestingly, the one Diana Nyad I did last week, there's a movie that, um, is, that Annette Benning plays Diana Nyad. Mm. Jodie Foster plays her trainer, Bonnie Stoll, who's a good friend of mine. Um, so I don't know. Maybe there's an in there. Also, women, I think, are who are 
marketers of the highest order. That's fascinating to me. And Kim Kardashian or Kris Jenner has to be mm-hmm. at the top of that list of how did they do it? How really, how so did they do it? It's funny. So one of our fine sponsors, mm-hmm. iConnections, okay, they host this huge global alts. Um, you know, yeah. And we were down there this year. It was in January. And, you know, they had thousands of allocators, thousands of fund managers at the Fountain Blue in South Beach. And there was a whole host of people, Guy Adami and I, we were interviewing a lot of, like, big fund managers. And this stuff. the biggest draw Kim for that Kardashian. day was Kim Kardashian. Okay, right. Which is... For- Several reasons. Well, I, you know, but it, but it's interesting. A lot of, and I didn't see it. We were doing Fast Money at the time, um, but it was interesting. A lot of the feedback was like, "Man, she's really smart," yeah. and she's, do, you know, what I mean, like I doing that sort that. of thing. Yeah. And so I just thought that was really interesting. And I've never really heard her say more than a few words, you know. So um, Kim Kardashian's mm-hmm. on your Mount Rushmore of yes. how she. And then it. somebody like Elena Kagan, I would. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. they don't. I don't know that they would, would do that. Any of the justices do that kind of thing, but um, in today's world, Venus why Williams, not? I mean, um, yeah, that would be a great one. Yeah, that would be a great one. Um, you I just interviewed your sister. Yes. I mean, Wendy Feinerman. I know. Well, I, I do you know, know all your siblings. Yeah. And one, each one more fascinating than that. Wendy's up there though, because Wendy's got a few. And I say, I admire this. She's got a few screw looses, which <laughs> as do I. And I think it's great. So how did that go? It went. Fine. It uh, was, I mean, obviously we know each other very well. Yeah. And it's interesting to think of her, not as my sister, but as a person, if I didn't know her and I would say, well, right. she's really, she's really done something. How did that, how did she well, do Well, I mean, it? tell you, I mean, she won an Academy she Award. She won an Academy which Award. Which is amazing. Right, for Forrest Gump, where she really was the champion of that movie, it took years to make. Mm-hmm. And um, so... Then she did Devil Wears Prada, which I just think is fantastic. One of like for me the all time great airplane movie. Mm-hmm. And uh, she did. Step I love Mom. Stepmom. See, Stepmom yeah. to me, Susan well, Sarandon a, yeah. and and Julia Roberts in that movie. And I think it was was who was the actor? Ed Harris. Ed Harris, who yes. I love. Yeah. So he obviously was married to Susan Sarandon. He leaves Susan Sarandon for a younger woman. Susan Sarandon gets cancer. She winds up being extraordinarily close. With the end of that movie, yeah. if you're not yeah. crying, you're not yeah. a human being. Right. That's a great movie. It is a great movie, and that you know that relationship where you know Susan Sarandon sort of handing her children off. Yes. To Julia Roberts, knowing, knowing that she's yeah, that she will not be their parent. Her, I'm she crying now. I no, know. It's a, it, like, can I say horrible. something? It's a great movie. Yeah. yeah. And that's a Wendy. F- but and, anyway, and can, Drumline is a fantastic mm-hmm. movie. If you, I mean. Yeah, so there's that, and then I know her well. I know how kooky she is. I know what her makeup. Um, she, I mean, she's 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 a force of nature. She is a force of and, nature. And she gets things done. She gets. We talk shit, about Mary Duffy getting but, things done. But Wendy you know, Carter you have another sister that's done Iron Men. So yeah. I mean, that's mm-hmm. the other side of the people a little with some screw loose yes. spectrum. Yeah, I mean, you should have her on as well. <laughs> Yes, I'm thinking about it. Uh, yeah, there's a, we're a kooky bunch for sure. I love yeah. it. I think it's great. I mean, I've listened to all of them. I will listen to the next five that come out. I mean, how she does it. I, I mean, like, so I, well. I, so you know, yeah, Dan. Yeah. You know, Karen came into the green room months ago and said, "I'm doing this." Yeah, podcast. you had a name. You named what it. should the name be? And I'm, and I said, "I will come up with a name for you." And she told yeah. me what it was about. <laughs> and I came in the next day. I'm like, I got the name. Why the letter Y not, which is genius. It is genius. I got to say, it is genius. But yes. she didn't go with So that. any of you guys well, listening here who want to start a, a podcast, I just gave <laughs> you a free idea. Available. Yeah, why not? Yeah. But it, well, because it's sort of an audio, no, it's I an audio, vis- yeah. you know, uh, medium, not a video. But that but was I, brilliant. I, I w- is it Guy? I mean, I'm not always surprised. I'm very... I'm pleasantly, you know. No, you're always surprised. When Guy comes up with smart things, but it happens it's, all the time. It's a, it's a miracle. And nobody gets a bigger kick out of it than Guy. Of course, that is true. <laughs> nobody gets a bigger kick out of themselves than me. I could be on a desert. I say this all the time. I'd be fine because <laughs> yeah. I make myself laugh almost on a daily basis. Ba- More yeah. on it, d- d- hour yeah. to hour. You Dan can... would be furious at himself the entire time. Mm-hmm, maybe. <laughs> oh. Does it, so before we go, yeah. are you surprised how long our show has lasted? Yes. I am. Well, I was really hesitant to sign that first two-year contract. <laughs> really hesitant. And I just signed an eighth one. Yeah, it's incredible, yeah. right? I remember, I do remember having this thought, oh, I don't know about this show. I'm a hedge fund manager. What will that do to my reputation? And then it occurred to me, you're a hedge fund manager. What kind of reputation <laughs> what, do you yeah. have? So, Do people 
when you do, what do people recognize you from do you think the industry the show because you the are show for sure don't you think i mean uh, I went, I we went to I forget I don't know a restaurant or somewhere uh, Finerman and they're like he's the Karen Finerman <laughs> Finerman right well that's me <laughs> yeah um, and I said yeah he's like oh I watch your show all the time it's just funny where you meet people that do seem to watch has the anybody show. have you been approached by somebody that you admire and this happens because I know these people watch the show we were talking about Michael Burns from Lionsgate he uh -huh. watches the show religiously. Terry Duffy's the CEO of CME Group, watches the show on a nightly basis. I know for a fact that regardless of what Jamie says, Jamie Dimon has CNBC on in the background. Yeah. He watches the show. Lloyd Blank yeah. a laundry list of people that watch the show. Does that surprise you? It does, actually. Doesn't it surprise you Absolutely. guys? Absolutely. You're like, you're watching us? But that's the <laughs> highest compliment when people in our world actually watch. And I think... Listen, we have fun. We enjoy each other's company. I also happen to think, and I'm, this is just my opinion, the best questions during the network during the day are asked on our show, I think, by us collectively. And then the, the synthesis or the feedback or whatever, the, the statements we make on the back of it, I think is the reason why people well, watch I the show. I think that's the beauty of the structure. I mean, like when I think about it, like, um, you know, we are market participants. We're kind of in the moment. There's a bit of emotion. And I think what, what the brilliance of what some of these awesome people who are on, uh, you know, who are journalists, who are hosts all day long, like a Melissa, she mm -hmm. can be surgical. It's not trying to get to emotion, trying to get to the truth of a situation or something like that to help a listener. We're not always trying to accomplish that. We're thinking about it the way you were sitting in, in a risk R meeting when you had a meeting with a, you're trying to get to the truth so you can be right on a situation. Yes. And I think sometimes those are really different um, sensibilities a little bit. So um, I agree with that though, guy. It's fun. It's, I mean, listen, they created something that's different than what's on all day long and i think that's what's really cool about it i know it's i mean it's and it's super fun for us and now we're all podcasters so so that's karen <laughs> feinerman it's how she does it you can find it in your favorite i love that your podcast favorite podcast store. what makes I, I one know. store more i mean <laughs> it's more easy, special than another I mean, it's, store it depends where you get your music and that sort of thing so karen we really really appreciate you coming on and talking about the pod and just talking about life in general i love hanging with you guys We'll do it. Should we do it in an hour or so uptown? Yeah, we're going. Let's right. go. Off we Fast go. Money, baby. All right. Thanks so much, Karen, right. for being here. Bye, guys.